Good morning. Welcome to the Bureau of Economic Geology's Austin Earth Science Zoomerama. I'm Linda Ruiz McCall, the Bureau's Information Geologist and Resource Center Manager. For those of you watching live, our rules for using Zoom are such that to, we are unable to use the chat features, but if you have questions, you can email them to zoomerama at beg.utexas.edu and we'll answer them at the end of the presentation. Before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsors, Equinor and Austin Geological Society for their generous support. Today's presentation is from uh, the Bureau of Economic Geology's own Mark Blunt. Mark promotes the innovative and trusted energy, environmental and economics research of the Bureau of Economic Geology. External and governmental affairs roles include marketing and communication, media relations, outreach to the Texas legislature, industry engagement, event coordination, land management, donor cultivation, and educational outreach. So Mark keeps busy here. <laughs> Mark has, an ex has extensive experience in public relations, resource development, and nonprofit management, and was a petroleum landman for over 10 years. He received a dual bachelor degrees in re uh, radio, television, film, and history from the University of Texas at Austin, and he enjoys more than 20 years of service on the staff at UT. Mark was involved in the initial uh, work developing Earth Date, and today he's going to provide us an overview of that uh, resource, it, which Earth Date is a public service radio program, and it has an accompanying website, earthdate.org. The mission is to engage listeners in earth science and connect them with the wonders of the world. Mark, thank you very much for joining us today. Appreciate it. The floor is yours. Well, thank, thank you very much, Linda. Thanks for that kind introduction. Um, and I also thank you for organizing the, the Zoomorama. This mm -hmm. is a great opportunity to share some really, really interesting earth science with our guests. And it's thank my all pleasure. Of, oh, you <laughs> bet. And, uh, and thank all of you for joining us this morning. I think we're going to have some fun and we may learn a, a few things in the process. Today, we're, we are going to talk about Earth Date, the Bureau of Economic Geology's national radio program that explores the wonders of the Earth each week. But before that, though, I'd like to tell you just a little bit about the Bureau of Economic Geology, where both Linda and I work. The Bureau was established in 1909, so we've been around for 111 years, mm -hmm. and it's the oldest organized research unit of the University of Texas. We're also the State Geological Survey for Texas, and we do a lot of work for the state. Dr. Scott Tinker, whom you just met, is indeed the Bureau's director, and he's also the State Geologist of Texas. Now, the Bureau's mission is to serve society by conducting objective, impactful, and integrated geoscience research on relevant energy, environmental, and economic issues. And our vision is to be a trusted scientific voice to academia, industry, government, and the public whom we serve. We're now part of the Jackson School of Geosciences at the University of Texas at Austin. Now, talented people are really our formula for success. Our research staff includes more than 130 scientists, engineers, and economists from 27 different countries working in integrated multidisciplinary research teams. Together with a large number of skilled graduate students and a professional support staff of about 50 people, our team finds solutions to the world's greatest challenges in energy and environmental research. Service to society is a crucial element of the, of the Bureau's mission, and we inform the public about geoscience issues and provide educational outreach. And today's Zoomerama is a great example of that educational outreach. Great facilities and state-of-the-art lab equipment give our researchers the tools they need to find objective rock-based answers to earth science questions. We house 18 individual labs at our facility on the Pickle Research Campus of the University of Texas, where we investigate everything from nanoparticles to shale formations. Beyond that, we operate three massive well core research and storage facilities in Houston, Austin, and Midland, Texas, 
which collectively house the largest archive of rock material in the world. Now, let me tell you just a little bit about Earth Date. Earth Date is a weekly radio program providing fun and informative audio episodes which focus on the workings and the complexity of our planet, its geology, its environment, and its major geological events, both distant and more recent. Earth Date was created by and is hosted by Dr. Scott Tinker, and it explores Earth's resources and processes and how they impact our daily lives. Dr. Tinker shares his insights gained from a long and very distinguished career in the geosciences into the issues that make the study of our planet so fascinating and sometimes so controversial. Earth Date was launched on Earth Day in the April of 2017. The program has grown remarkably and is now aired on over 400 radio stations in all 50 states, Canada, New Zealand, and the Philippines. The dots on this map behind me represent all of the communities in the US and Canada where you can hear the program on the radio. Supported by EarthX, which is an organization that brings people together to build a sustainable future, Earth Date brings new perspectives to listeners about how the Earth works. Our audience learns about the vast geological timescale and how events of billions of years ago still shape how we interact with the Earth today. Listeners hear discussions about the resources our planet provides us and how our environment has changed and adapted over millions of years. They hear clear and concise explanations of current hazardous events like sinkholes, earthquakes, landslides, and tsunamis. We recently completed production of our 192nd weekly episode. The Earth Date website, as Linda mentioned, is earthdate.org, and it's where episodes can be heard and materials can be accessed and downloaded free of charge. It's a wonderful resource for science teachers, and thousands of them use them every class day. The program is searchable by keyword, and it's a terrific place to find information about a broad array of topics in the Earth sciences. Each episode is accompanied by a peer-reviewed background summary and a linked reference list. So I'm going to try and share my screen. There we are. So there is the Earth Date homepage. This is earthday.org. And as you'll see from uh, the homepage, all of the episodes are included on, right, right here on the homepage. You can click on any of them to listen. Um, the, it's, it's got the latest episode last, or first rather, this is episode number 192. Um, and we record 13 new episodes every three months. So we record qu quarterly. So there's um, very frequently, you, there's always a fresh batch of, uh, of episodes available. And as I mentioned, we're, we're fully searchable. So let's search the word, let me make sure this is, there we go, water. And what pops up are all of the episodes that use have water in the title that feature water. And then here are many, many more episodes that include water in the topic discussion. So why don't we play a few episodes for you? I've selected several programs that represent different aspects of earth science. The first one is about the history of the Earth and how our climate has been in a constant state of change for billions of years. It's called Greenhouse Icehouse Earth. From the Bureau of Economic Geology, this is Earth Day. For the majority of Earth's history, the planet has been hotter than today. Hotter periods make up some 70% of the past two and a half billion years and are called greenhouse Earth. They can last hundreds of millions of years with CO2 levels 10 to 20 times higher than today and no ice anywhere on the planet. During a greenhouse interval, Earth actually explodes with life. The age of dinosaurs happened during a greenhouse. 
Land animals covered the continents. Reptiles swam in Arctic seas. Birds, mammals, and flowering plants first appeared. It's been colder the other 30% of the past two and a half billion years, called Ice House Earth. Life struggles in the most severe of these times. Within ice house periods, Earth has shorter cycles of glacials and interglacials. Glacial periods last about 80,000 years when ice sheets cover large parts of the continents. Interglacials last for 20,000 years or less and ice retreats toward the poles. We're living in a mild interglacial of a long-term ice house now. Temperate climate for many millennia has allowed the human population to expand to what it is today. Human activity may be accelerating warming, but historical climate patterns suggest that within a few thousand years, we could enter another glacial period when ice would slowly advance again from the poles. Why we shift from ice house to greenhouse and glacial to interglacial are important concepts, which we'll explore on another Earth Day. Until then, I'm Scott Tinker. Earth Date is produced by the Bureau of Economic Geology at the University of Texas at Austin. So I hope this episode gives you uh, 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 some scientific perspective on the current debate about climate change. Um, I'd like to show you this, the page. Each one of the episode pages are laid out on earthday.org. Um, at first, on every one of the episode pages is the actual script, um, the script that, uh, that Dr. Tinker presented. Um, and this is the script is based on some, some very significant scientific research that went into each topic. Um, here below that is the background information. This is the, the, um, uh, the collection of all of the research that was conducted in order to be able to prepare the episode. And below that are references. Um, these are all linked to the various um, uh, resources that were accessed in order to be able to draw the scientific information needed to prepare the episode. And then below that are the contributors. Um, and an, in addition to the, the folks, uh, the academic uh, experts who reviewed the information to assure its, uh, uh, its scientific uh, accuracy, um, um, it also lists uh, Julie Hennings, who does the research uh, very, very admirably for Earth Date, and Harry Lynch, who directs the episodes and, and helps in the script preparation. So that's what every one of the, uh, um, the episode uh, pages uh, contains. And I hope, you know, so it's, it's uh, they're just very, very thoroughly researched and well done. Life on Earth from bacteria to blue whales is remarkably diverse. The next episode introduces us to the heaviest organism on our planet, and it lives right here in the U.S. in the state of Utah. The program is called Pando, a forest of one. From the Bureau of Economic Geology, this is Earth Day. If you've ever walked through an aspen grove, you've seen hundreds or thousands of white trunks propping up a sky of silvery green leaves trembling in the wind. In the fall, all the leaves in one grove will go from green to gold at the same time. This is because the entire grove is really just one organism, a massive root system from which many trunks sprout, grow, die, and are replaced by new trunks. The largest aspen grove in the world, in Utah, is named Pando. Latin for I spread out. It sprouted 80,000 years ago from a seed the size of a pepper grain and now supports almost 50,000 trunks, making it the heaviest living thing in the world and one of the oldest. But Pando is slowly declining. Most of its trunks are now more than 100 years old. New ones aren't growing to take the place of those that die. Researchers think it has to do with elk and mule deer. A century ago, ranchers and trappers removed their natural predators from the area. Local populations of elk have grown to more than 77,000 and mule deer to 300,000. And the grazing elk and deer are eating the aspen saplings. Studies that fenced off sections of the grove have seen young trees return, growing 10 feet in just a few years. Ranchers don't want to reintroduce non-human predators who might endanger their livestock. So, the solution may be to fence pando to protect it from deer or to change hunting practices to thin the herds. I'm Scott Tinker.
Earth Date is produced by the Bureau of Economic Geology at the University of Texas at Austin with support from Schlum. I had never heard of Pando before this episode was recorded. And it's a it's a really fascinating story. Several Earth Date episodes talk about what we know about ancient life from the fossils that the animals and plants left behind in the rocks. So I have a question for you. Did real dinosaurs growl and roar like they do in the movies? Let's find out in the next episode, Prehistoric Soundscape. From the Bureau of Economic Geology, this is Earth Day. Imagine you're being chased by a T-Rex. What would you hear? Some very big footsteps, some very heavy breathing, someone screaming, maybe that's you. What else? Scientists have been trying to determine what the prehistoric world sounded like by studying the sounds of modern animals. Sounds of aggression, like roars and screams. Sounds of communication, like birdsong or a wolf howl. Perhaps most amazing, echolocation, used by bats and whales to find prey and avoid obstacles. The organs required to make and hear these sounds had to evolve sometime. So scientists went looking for them in the fossil record, and here's what they found. For 90% of Earth's history, the only sounds were natural phenomena, like waves and thunder. That would have made little difference to early life forms, because none of them could hear. Then, around 400 million years ago, crustaceans started making clicking sounds. Early fishes, looking for a meal, developed the ability to hear them. It took land animals a long time to catch up, but by 200 million years ago, insects were chirping, early birds were honking, and to track them, predators developed the tympanic eardrum. So what would you have heard from that tyrannosaur? Well, not much. He might have been able to huff or hiss, but with no vocal cords, he couldn't roar like in the movies. And he'd probably be too far behind you anyway. Turns out T-Rex may have been much slower than we thought, but that's a story for another Earth date. I'm Scott Tinker, sounding off. Earth Date is produced by the Bureau of Economic Geology at the University of Texas at Austin. A number of Earth Date episodes explore our blue planet, where water is the key ingredient for life. Did you ever wonder why you can actually smell a rain shower? Let's find out next in The Scent of Rain. From the Bureau of Economic Geology, this is Earth Date. Pause for a moment and imagine the scent of rain. You can almost feel it in your nose. There's that bright, sweet smell on the wind before the rain comes. Then the scent of fresh earth and grass as the rain falls. And a damp, musty aroma like a forest floor that lingers afterward. What gives rain these distinctive aromas? And why do we find them so memorable? Well, the pre-rain smell is ozone. Lightning in the clouds splits nitrogen and oxygen gas into single atoms, which recombine into things like nitric acid and ozone. Downdrafts and the first drops of rain carry ozone to the ground, where we experience it as a sweet, lightly acidic smell. As the rain starts falling, drops of water strike plants in the ground and liberate organic compounds and aromatic oils, splashing them into the air as aerosols. Once the soil and dead leaves on its surface become wet, bacteria begin to produce geosmin, an alcohol that's a signature, musty basement smell of decaying plant matter. Humans are incredibly sensitive to the smell of geosmin. We're able to pick up just a few parts per trillion in the air. And scientists think there's a very good reason for this. Early humans depended on natural water sources. Those who could find water where their noses prospered. Those who couldn't may not have survived to pass on their genes and noses to the next generation. I'm Scott Tinker. Earth Date is produced by the Bureau of Economic Geology at the University of Texas at Austin. That ability to smell water really gave our ancient ancestors an advantage in what was a very dangerous prehistoric world. Naturally, as Earth Date is production of the Bureau of Economic Geology, we have a number of episodes that feature the geological world. Now we see evidence of ancient geological process, processes all around us, but really major geological events have only rarely taken place 
in the relatively short history of humankind. One terrifying example of a dynamic geological event literally changed the world in 2004. Let's relive the day the earth shook. From the Bureau of Economic Geology, this is Earth Day. The day after Christmas in 2004, a tsunami swept over Indonesia, Thailand, and 12 other countries. It killed more than 230,000 people in the most lethal natural disaster in recorded history. Most of us remember the news footage from those grim days. What you may not remember is that the tsunami was caused by an earthquake. Scientists now know it was the most powerful earthquake in 40 years, a 9.3 on the Richter scale. Its epicenter was below the ocean floor, about 100 miles west of Sumatra. The quake had the longest duration ever recorded, about 10 minutes of continuous motion as the Earth's crust ripped to form a 50-foot cliff on the seafloor. The tear continued moving north for almost an hour, finally extending more than 750 miles. It was the huge volume of water displaced by this movement that caused the tsunami. The quake shook the ground everywhere on the Earth and triggered powerful aftershocks and earthquakes as far away as Alaska. The entire planet vibrated for weeks. GPS data showed changes in the surface of most of the Eastern Hemisphere. Masses inside the Earth shifted, which moved the location of the North Pole by an inch. Even the shape of the globe changed, very slightly, but enough to increase its rotational speed and shorten the length of the day by three microseconds. December 26, 2004 was a shocking day in Earth's history for humans and the planet itself. I'm Scott Tinker, and this is Earth Day. Earth Date is produced by the Bureau of Economic Geology at the University of Texas at Austin. That 2004 earthquake was the worst natural disaster in human history and was a geological event that many of us will never forget. Well, I hope you've enjoyed learning a little bit about Earth Date and the great scientific resources that we offer. Again, thank you so much for being here today. Now I'd like to turn it over, back over to Linda McCall as we continue today's Earth Date presentation. Linda? Mark, thank you so much. That was a great overview of the variety of information that is out on Earth Date and what a resource that is. Did you say there's 250 or so episodes already posted? 192. 192 uh, since 2017. So that's an amazing body of work and a lot of great information for students out there. Thank you. I just wanted to take a little bit of time to focus on how students could use Earth Date as a research tool. And, you know, today with all of the information sources available to you, I, I'm sure your teachers have talked to you about this before. It's important that you understand the quality of the information. Uh, if you just Google something, you may find that there's a lot of information out there that is inaccurate, misleading, and that's one reason that uh, I would recommend using Earth Date as a resource because it's vetted. It's checked for accuracy and validity. And um, one of the people in the group, the main person in Earth Date responsible for that is Julie Hennings, who serves as the content producer and researcher for Earth Date. Um, and I asked uh, Julie, you know, how did you, how did you go about researching this? Well, Julie has over 30 years of experience working as a geoscientist, number one, and a lot of uh, good contacts and, and background in her own experience. Um, her focus has always been on communicating scientific knowledge. Uh, so she tells me she wakes up early in the morning and she starts checking the scientific news. She looks at dozens of scientific journals, news sites, university and museum websites and magazines. And it gives her some time to formulate ideas. She also will check with researchers. And if you look on Earth Date, uh, it's open for anyone to suggest an idea for a new episode. Um, sometimes Julie also uh, gets information. She'll interview researchers, many of them at UT and other uh, universities and locations. And uh, she takes this information and just very carefully selects sources 
Um, often, Julie said she'll have at least 20 great resources for every episode, but she'll post the, the top five are usually posted when you look at the site. And, you know, one of the things that may indicate that you are a scientist if, is if you have a very curious mind, because that's part, pretty much the, the essence of doing research. You, you have this quest to want to know why things work, how they work. Um, the, um, Julie mentioned that, um, this is a quote from her, I asked her, she said, the key to have is to have insatiable curiosity and luckily, I've been curious since I was a child. So if that's something that uh, you think about yourself, we encourage it. I think it's in human nature to be curious. Science may be a career path for you. But uh, let's take a look at Earth Date now and let me show you some of the ways you can use it for research. So as Mark mentioned um, before, Earth Date is uh, has a website and uh, one of the features that uh, you can have is a search field. So if you click on search, uh, I'm going to put in the word water. Water is an area I have a lot of interest in and it's so important to the earth. You'll see uh, that there are many, many episodes that uh, come up as having some aspect of water. In fact, if we look at this one, we'll see that we have, how many pages? 13 pages of episodes that uh, have some aspect of water. Now, one, one of the things that I, I wanted to show you too, let's click on how Earth makes fresh water. When you go to the site, I'd like you to know you can also download the PDF file if you'd like to do that. Sometimes you'd like to have a copy of it. Uh, you can save it in your files electronically or you can print it. Sometimes that helps with educators and there's a black and white version as well as a color version. But how Earth makes fresh water is a really great topic. And here you think about the water cycle. The earth is covered mostly with salt water in the ocean, but when that water evaporates and, and uh, precipitates back down as fresh water uh, on the earth, that's how we cycle and get fresh water. And one of the uh, things that you'll see here are these different um, resources that you can go to. For instance, here we have uh, the uh, uh, USGS, Fundamentals of the Water Cycle. That was one of the big sources for this. USGS has great information on their site. And there you can see that was the source of the uh, water cycle diagram we had in Earth Date. Now notice uh, there's a lot of facts that have come beyond just the, the script for the episode. We've listed a lot of facts on earth, like 97.5% of the water uh, on earth ha is salt water and only 2.5% is fresh. Very unique. Now, there's also something I'd like to point out that you might be able to do as a, an experiment in your home. Notice here, uh, you see this pot of boiling water. Now that's a process where you can uh, boil water. Sometimes fresh water has impurities and there will be a boil water notice in your community uh, that you boil it for a certain period of time and then you let it cool for drinkable water. There are links to explain that here. Uh, the, you could do an experiment at home where you boil water to obtain distilled water. And I want to show you an, an image of that. And notice uh, if you were to, to boil water in a pot uh, and you could tie on a coffee mug onto the lid as it boils, the, the uh, water will, um, uh, the water vapor will condense uh, condense on this top of the lid and drip into 
the coffee mug. Now, if you're ever in an emergency situation where the water may have a lot of heavy metals or toxins, uh, salt water, never drink salt water. Uh, this is an emergency way to, to obtain fresh water. And an experiment, I'd recommend you do this with uh, your parents or a teacher to try this at home or uh, it's something maybe you can do in your classroom uh, to make your own fresh water. And it, it also is a good model for the way um, the earth's fresh water is made through the water cycle. So um, this is, there's so much that is out there on Earth Date. As I said, you could use it to search on many different topics, follow those links, look at the underlying sources. It's a great way to help you build a wonderful research topic and get ideas on how you might follow uh, some of your own curiosity and learn more about the Earth. So uh, with that, uh, I just wanted to have a little bit of time for questions. Um, Mark, I have one for you that, you know, part of what we're, we're doing here with our uh, Earth Science Week is to talk to students about careers. And, and I know you have not been trained in college as a geoscientist, but it seems to me most of your career, you've worked in the area of geosciences. And I'm just wondering if you could share a little bit about how you ended up on your career. What, what gave you this curiosity to eventually work in, in the field of geosciences as a communication expert? Well, as a, I guess as a child, uh, my, my parents had a, a few acres outside of Seguin, Texas, um, that's very unique geologically. There are a lot of, of it's very sandy soil with a lot of, of, uh, of alluvial sand and, and a lot of rocks that are on the surface. And so as a kid, my little brother and I used to walk around and collect rocks. And we had uh, uh, the, the, the living room of the little, the little ranch house there on that property was full of rocks. We had a, a bookcase that was full of different rocks, a lot of petrified wood, different things like that. So for, from the time I was a little kid, I, I, I had an interest in, in, in the study of rocks. Um, but then um, uh, I was, uh, as you mentioned, I was a petroleum landman and became uh, um, educated into oil and gas exploration. And of course, that's all subsurface geology. Mm -hmm. um, and so I had a, a very good background in that. My younger brother um, pursued a career in geology um, and he is a geologist. Um, and so uh, anyway, it was just kind of, you know, part of the family. And, uh, and naturally, um, as um, uh, I worked at UT and became familiar with the Bureau of Economic Geology and some of the, the really fascinating stuff that the Bureau does, um, it, was, uh, it was a real dream of mine to, to come over here and, and, uh, and find a position. And, uh, and fortunately, uh, I was able to, to, uh, to work my, my way into the, to the Bureau family. So, um, so that's, that's my, my geology story. <laughs> That's a good one. You know, it, uh, I've talked with teachers that are experts in uh, early learning, like kindergarten through second grade, and they've told me that the number one manipulative uh, resource for uh, that's something that you handle and work with for for young people are rocks and teachers will say if they start a rock collection in their room before they know it, their room is overflowing with rocks that the <laughs> children bring in. So <laughs> I don't, I don't doubt that. <laughs> Good. Well, I want to thank you very much for, for joining us, Mark, in your presentation on Earth Day and thank the audience. Uh, we will be, uh, for those of you uh, who uh, are, uh, viewing us uh, online. We will be posting our recording of this on YouTube. So if you have a question that you'd like answered, you'll be welcome to post it in the comment fields and we'll do our best to get an answer to you. Um, also check the description and the video links for more information about the Bureau and our research and our Austin Earth Science <clears throat> Zoomorama site. Uh, we have another, our next session is scheduled for uh, Tuesday, October the 13th at 10 o'clock Central Standard Time. Uh, we have some of our Bureau, uh, not Bureau, but UT paleontologists that will be featured. And their topic is about what, what we do, how fossils uh, can tell you about uh, past life forms. 
so we thank you very much for joining us and look forward to seeing you again. Thank you. Thanks, Linda.